So to start off, we use Tamiya XF1 as a primer. I've stopped doing that since this build, but at the time I was still using it. I was experimenting a lot with thinning and different airbrushes, trying to get my, my painting style to work correctly. You'll see that I'm doing a lot of fine lines, almost in like a scribbly crosshatch kind of fashion. The only difference between uh, how I thin paint in this video and my, my previous Tiger one was I just thinned it twice as much, if not more, and I got really, really good results. The airbrush is a very cheap Chinese Veda 120. They don't last very long, but they get the job done. So the whole process was actually pretty time consuming the way I primed this one, very thin lines everywhere. You'll notice that this build, if you saw any of that, was a combination of Dragon and Tamiya parts. The, the Tamiya Panther G kit. Priming this way did take a lot longer, but it looks a lot better. Very, very clean coat. So the base coat this time around is actually Tamiya buff. So what I'm going for with this is a late war tritonal camo. And uh, I own a number of pieces of uh, real uh, late war paint. And it, it actually is more yellow than this, but a lot of the images you see, I think, due to the medium desaturated, kind of look like this. And it's a really good base to start. You can totally filter it towards yellow more. It, it, it's odd because it's, you know, tan. It has very little hue. Um, but you'll see as I paint this that it actually works quite well. So I think buff as a base for late war tritonal is a very good idea. Again though, it does take a very long time to paint, so I skip ahead a lot, but you can see that the, the way that I was painting, very small lines and very slowly, does leave a very pretty coat with that Tamiya paint. So, it, you know, um, using these wheel masks I know is kind of lazy, but um, it's really helpful be just because of how many it can hold. It's not that I can't get a circle template, I have some, but I think that um, if you work full time and you don't have a lot of time to do this stuff, and so my, my bench time was very precious, um, I want to be able to get something done. I want to sit down and say, I'm doing wheels right now. So here's the start of the camo. Now I filmed this whole camo process, and I'm sorry if it bores anybody. Um, but, as you can see, I'm looking at an image reference, which you can't see, it's off screen, and then I'm just kind of sketching. I'll go in and do a little bit, back off, do a little bit, back off, do it, like I'm, right now I'm just outlining it, and then I'll start to fill it in like that. So I'll just do the general shapes, I'll fill in the general shapes, kind of back it out, look at it, turn it around, make sure I like what I'm doing, and then as I go to new shape after new shape, I'll go back to the older shapes as the, the paint is kind of settled or dried a bit, and then I'll just do another coat over top of it to make sure that it's coating correctly. So it takes a really long time. Here I have the turret back on. I'm trying to match up some of the lines. Um, as you can see, I just go from spot to spot to spot. I don't do one part at a time. I just kind of sketch it out. This took an enormous amount of time. I think this was an entire night. Um, I would do a color. I think I did the base and all the camo at the same time. And I would do like a color and kind of walk away, do something else, come back. So it was worth it. Like here again, you see just the outline of that shape, a real rough fill in of the shape. Now, one thing that I, I like to point out to people is that a common mistake in my opinion is that people use too large of movements when they paint camo. Um, and why it ends up looking wrong is that the people that painted the actual tanks were using, you know, their, in, in this case, they'd be 35th scale arms, little arms that could only make uh, certain stroke movements. They were never going to be able to make a big flowing curve because they're too small, you know, in comparison to what we are when we're painting. So that's why I make these tiny little lines uh, or shapes, if you see it. I know it's sped up, but you can see that I'm barely ever moving the thing. And if I make like a, a curve shape, I try to make that curve shape with as many different little movements as possible to try to mimic what it would be like if a tiny little dude was painting it with um, a sprayer. But I'm getting close here now to having all of the brown done. This, by the way, is just hull red. 
I find that that works pretty well for late war as well. So it's just piece by piece. I think there's one part I changed uh, the back left hull side. I went back and touched up off camera after I was done with all of it. This part was pretty difficult because I wanted to get that uh, kind of painted on top only uh, with kind of the waves on it. And then I also grabbed some of the, the middle wheels and painted them to match because I knew I wanted to match up the outer wheels with the camel color. This again is um, what I always use, which is Tamiya's Field Gray as um, olive groom. I don't like their green colors because they're very dark. Now, I'm not saying that's uh, inaccurate. I have a couple of um, tool clamps and stuff that have tritonal camo on them, real tritonal camo, and the green is almost bluish and very, very dark. Um, I mistook it for Panzer Gray when I first saw it. Um, so now I'm just kind of trying to find the way that these shapes will match up. There was a guy's um, build that I used as a reference that I had images of. So I would look at that and then because people are imperfect, you know, I wasn't mimicking it because I couldn't. So then I would just do my best version of that and then I had to kind of find a way to, to make his camel pattern work with what I had already done and how could I fit this shape here and there's parts of it that I couldn't see so I had to invent myself. They say to never work from someone else's build but um, this guy had done a beautiful camo job and um, I just like the look of it. One important part here was trying to leave as much um, yellow as possible. And you can also see if you look at the video that the buff takes on a, a more rich tone just by being surrounded by the other colors. It's sort of the nature of, of color that way. It, it has a richness that it shouldn't really have because that Tamiya buff is very um, not like that. So, I mean, this is taking quite a while in... in two times time lapse of heavy editing. You can imagine this was my entire night the day I painted this. But if you've ever been afraid to do a camo pattern like this, um, as you start to succeed, it, it like fuels your excitement for the thing. But the whole time you're pretty worried that you'll, you'll mess it up and that was pretty intense, but um, it was probably the best airbrushing I've ever done. And I was really glad that I had filmed the whole thing but just little part by little part, not being afraid to do a chunk of a shape and then come back and change that shape or add to that shape. Or at certain times I even um, did touch ups where I'd come back over the shape. The lines at the edges of these things though, they're sharp or hard edged, but not really because they're just being done with an airbrush from like, you know, half an inch away from the model. And then again, a couple of wheels got painted. All right, so we have already primed these tracks. These are Kaizen's workable tracks and I'm using um, just a Tamiya brown to prime them because uh, it looks like the actual track primer paint that they used in the war. Um, I never understood why model color had such a colored paint, but um, I have some of that here as well, um, a track link with some real paint on it, and it's a little lighter than this, but it's a good base. This is me uh, just cleaning up the rubbers and the tires because the masks are never perfect, so I just come in here, I, that's model color black thinned down with water and I just go around and fix it. Now this is the Vallejo Metal Color Paints. I know that you can use these um, these powders and I'm thinking about trying that, but I really like the look of this paint. I'm kind of a brute when it comes to subtlety, so this works pretty well for me because I can just kind of paint it on. It's also interesting that if you don't have like the most perfect coat or smoothness to a paint in this kind of an area, it's okay because if you look at a real one, they're kind of chippy in these areas where they get polished, not perfect. Now I'm doing the shiny parts of the wheels where the guide teeth of the tracks would rub up against it and polish them. If you want to see a good example of this in real life, check out uh, the Chieftain's video of the um, Panther out in California. He sits right next to it. And you can actually see the primer and the buffed metal on this area. It'd be an interesting thing to try to mimic that. It might not be something we could pull off in scale though. So this is um, using Future as a clear coat for my tracks. I don't show clear coating the whole thing, but I tend to do this on a lot of things. I think I overdid it on this build. So this is a mixture of some of those Vallejo paints. And I've since actually moved over to um, MIG's color that comes in his German tool set for this. This is too light. And if you can see, the pigments look kind of 
like milky like you can see the pigments too much and I really don't like that so over the course of painting this there's a little bit of a darker tone I'm mixing blacks in trying to get a more like a steel color that I want and then I kind of just committed to it because I figured out that I'd use too light of a color and I figured I'd just try to filter them out um, down to a darker color but then as always was constantly looking for a better one uh, this is model color flesh that's what I used for German wood um, all of their wood had a very blonde and yellowish color on at least these shovels and axes and things. So if you use this as a base and you have any skill with uh, doing wood grains with washes or oils, this is pretty accurate. Um, I don't have that skill, so mine end up just being like a, like a pin washed flesh color. But it looks pretty convincing. I'm painting the MG34 barrel just black because it's really small. Now this, this is the compressed paper handles on the wire cutters. Now what I did just right there, that's wrong. The edges or the knobs and the ends should not be that color. That's actually part of the holder on the panther. But, you know, we don't know that until we do it wrong and then it's really easy to remember that you did it the wrong way. So, for whatever reason, once my camo was done, I decided to use a, a filter right away. I'm still not 100% sure what my weathering process is and I've seen people do this and I think it actually negatively impacted the, the overall turnout of the thing because I, I put decals on here now there was a clear coat in between there but that's one of the areas that I I sometimes wonder what the best order of operations is I think I'm gonna kind of go without clear coats in the next time I do this these are aftermarket decals of the Hermann Goering division um, all of the Panthers that we're seeing with these markings should have a lot more spare tracks and stuff on the turret, but I just wanted to have uh, a particular type of marking. And I could always add the tracks later. So if you can see, there's a really high specular shine on the turret. I clear coated this thing way too much. And here I get in with the camera and show you. There's like a little bit of dust in there. Um, it's really shiny, and this fought me until the end of the build, and frankly still did uh, when it was done. So, starting with uh, oils, I am doing some fading. Kind of a mix between fading and uh, dot filter. So I'm just adding different reds to the red camo parts. Right now it's a pretty close uh, hue, and tonally it's pretty similar too, but it will add some variation. And then I especially like adding whites and yellows to the, um, the Dunkelgeld areas. And you can add white pretty much anywhere because it'll behave like rain streaks if you just stump it out. So here I'm just trying to figure out exactly if I'm trying to do a straight dot filter or fading. A little of both is fine as long as the surface of the paint has some tonal variation and has some interest, it's, it's pretty realistic. Here I'm just doing a, a pass on the yellows again. So you you can stump it out and step back, uh, maybe let the thinner dry and just say, is that noisy enough? It certainly didn't help that I would be on Skype with my, uh, my friend Panzermeister36 and he would ask me if I had started the weathering process yet. It's pretty demoralizing. Adding some uh, light greens into that camo was a really good move. Um, I should have done more of that. The same process is not going on on the sides now. It's really difficult um, to keep it interesting doing the exact same process. Here's an example of just fading. That's not streaking. And I'm just trying to work tones into the, the top plates. Definitely they should be faded. A little of yellow probably would have helped me out there, but you can see there's just some variation in the paint now. It's all you're trying to go for. No matter what I did on this build, it seemed like I couldn't quite get it to look weathered. I think that camo is just so intense. So here I'm starting with a pin wash. I'd already done some by the time that that shot was, was cut in. Um, I did a couple, to tell you the truth, with different types of uh, thinned oils. Um, I just tried to make it dirty, and I frankly think that it, the clear coat was so smooth that it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't stain. Like, it would wrap around... Um, details but on a Yag Panther that I'd done about two years ago it had just a lovely dirty um, 
stain look with the pin wash and it looked exactly like I wanted it to and I was really new at that time and it, sometimes it seems like the more I learn, the more I screw up. Um, but some of these areas work really well and some just, I mean the yellow picks it up really well. But these tritonal vehicles, you have to be really cautious uh, with contrast because it's hard to make anything pop off of there. So here I'm cleaning it up. Um, trying to streak it down vertically where I'm thinning it out. And if I take it off too much, I'll just do it again. Um, so some areas, uh, like this one in particular, I know it's difficult on the Tammy one because it's very smooth. There, it looks like there's flame cut there, but it's hard to get that the wash to set in that part of the turret if you don't let it dry long enough. The yellow wheels look pretty, pretty good. I would have liked a little more brown um, in there. Now that I'm watching this back, it feels like a really contrasty dirt, almost like oil. There's more cleaning up the wash, and, and then it always seemed to be too clean when I'd be done cleaning it up. So I start the chipping process. Now, in this case, I actually used um, a MIG Ammo Late War yellow as my, my chip color, because you can see with my filter on the buff, it, that the yellow on the tank looks pretty rich. And then MIG's attempt at the same yellow is different enough, and those paints are very, very thin, so they're very good to brush paint. So I'm just doing my first yellow pass on chips, which is what will be the outline of the chips. The whole no chip is too small idea going on here. I'm just running around, doing my best to uh, put it as, as many places as possible. Now, it's a late war panther. So the idea I had for it was that it barely ever saw any action whatsoever. So it's actually one of the least weathered things I've ever done, and that was intentional. But when you show that off to your friends, if they're they're good at weathering things, they're like, well, are you going to make it look good or are you just going to leave it like that? <laughs> it's, it's actually a tough thing to make something look kind of new. People seem to hate that. Um, but a, a Panther G, and the end of the war, I've got these um, Flammen Vernictors on there, which are the flame suppressors. And the only Panthers that had those were very late war and knocked out almost immediately. So um, I didn't want to chip it up too much. Long story short. So now I'm adding the um, German Camo Black Brown from Model Color in between the yellow spots, which will be the exposed steel. Now, since my... Actually, since filming this, um, I've been buying a lot more actual Panzer relics uh, for my collection, and I've noticed that every single thing that I own has bright red primer around all of the um, exposed steel parts. Now these things have been in a field for years, so it's hard to tell if they look like that then. But I used to kind of scoff at the guys who used red primer in their chipping process, but man, everything I have has red primer showing on it. Everything. But this is still a good look. Um, the yellow on the outsides makes the, the black-brown sink in, so it looks like it actually has depth. That's, again, something we use as a trick in the video game industry. So again though, there's not enough. I mean, I've seen uh, the dry brushing chipping technique, which I think maybe I should try. I've, I've honestly never dry brushed anything in any way, not, not to do a lightening or a darkening of something. I um, just haven't had the time yet. And, and I think that does look good at times when you don't want to do super heavy chipping, but you just want to wear away at something. So I'm doing a little raw metal chipping on this uh, C hook. Now this was a, a thing I debated for a long time. These Flamen Vernictors, um, I have them painted the base coat of the tank. And so I'm trying to just chip them up to look like the paint is, is burning off. But I didn't want, I wanted them to be primarily, you know, yellow. So it was really difficult to chip them up enough to even match the rest of the tank, much less a, a, any kind of standard look that models have and leave them uh, yellow. I know that most people do exhaust a lot more heavily than me but I'm just trying to match uh, photographs that I've seen. So this again is a, a rust enamel product that I put over top of my chips to try to make it look like the rust is starting to eat away at the metal surface around the chip. Um, most of the time I take the majority of it off and it'll leave really nice stains. Sometimes they're really hard to read uh, but it's it's odd because the overall um, rusty nature of it will read 
um, when you look at the piece as a whole. It's actually kind of difficult to see how it's going to feel um, when you're staring right at it. It's very subtle because I, I like to get rid of most of it, and I didn't do any heavy streaking, like heavy rust streaking on this one. To be perfectly honest, a lot of that comes from I just needed to finish it. Um, sometimes you get these builds that are on your bench forever, and you just need the, the rush of finishing it and the positivity of, of moving on. But, I mean, it's the same process. You dab a little of that rust effect on each spot, you let it dry a bit, you come back, you clean it up. So trying to maintain some vertical movement there as well, just in case any of the, the rust is showing. So here we've got two different color pigments, a darker and a lighter. And uh, I just kind of went to town. This is actually one of the most aggressive ways that I've ever um, weathered tracks. Now you can see that from when I painted them, they've been pinwashed with the same dark brown that I pinwashed before. So I just do a dark color really quickly and then a light color really quickly. Trying to make it as varied as possible. I think it turned out actually pretty well, and then here I'm coming back in with just some thinner to set it up. It's usually hard to read how those tracks are going to look after they've had that thinner application. So here's a comparison of side by side. On the right is just the original painted ones, and on the left is the pigments and enamel thinner. So here I'm using some Revel Contacta to glue on the inner wheels. Something a little slower drying because I normally have to pull wheels back off when I'm doing this uh, track setup. Um, nothing much to report here. Uh, I didn't know how weathered I wanted the wheels to be again. That actually was an issue with the Tiger build that I posted. and I liked what it looked like before I weathered or, or did pigments on the, the wheels, but it was just a bit too much, a little, just too much color. And in the end, I ended up making them very, very dirty, which I think a lot of guys don't want to do because it takes away from like your paint and your wash and it might be realistic, but it's not particularly fun to cover up your work. So here I'm using the exact same two pigments that I had used on the tracks on the wheels. And in my opinion, it covered up the paint just a little too much for my personal preference. Um, but when I see it sitting there, I like it quite a bit. Um, here I'm coming back with uh, some oil paints and just doing some kind of grime streaking. Just to try to mix up the uh, the look of the thing. It was a little bit too clean for me. And there you can see with the how the wheels came out. They're very, very grayish brown. And I ended up going back and cleaning some of that off as well. But this uh, oil streaking thing gave me a nice little finish. So. That's the end of my video. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to message me. Um, we'll see you in the next one.